everybody, and welcome back to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, I'm ready to Charles. talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, and not just any fantasy today, because today we're talking about oh. one of the most iconic like one of those mount rushmore faces of fantasy this is our first time reading one of her works on the show this was a series that we got to in friends pitching fantasy i pitched it to you and you selected it and now here we are today to discuss it i am of course referring to assassin's apprentice by robin hobb book one of the farcia trilogy that's exactly what we're here to discuss, Charles, and this is a reread for both of mm-hmm. us, this book, and I think it's been oh yeah over a decade for both of us as well since we got into this one, so it'll be interesting to get into our takes after like coming in with with mm-hmm. fresh new eyes, perspective Charles, where totally like different, different people. people you know they say yeah. like different people entirely than your the last cells time. every so often totally regenerate to the point where like you're a different person yeah that's <laughs> not true but they do they say, say that, that and, that's and what we're past that threshold <laughs> yeah. so. some of us choose to believe right if that were yeah if it were true that every seven years you all your cells in your body die and new ones come in <laughs> uh then yeah that it would have been that much time and it doesn't matter that that's not true at all because what matters is that we're here friends Mm -hmm. talking fantasy Mm -hmm. and we did come at it even if we're not entirely new cells we uh do have some uh, some fresh takes you know i've i have fresh eyes like before like the last time i read this i had 2020 vision i didn't have to wear glasses and now I, I've changed so much. My eyes are so fresh that they can no longer see well. And that's, that should that be That should celebrated. be celebrated. You know, my hairline was a lot <laughs> stronger as well. You know, you couldn't really see through to my scalp back then. But um, you can now. And I brought that perspective into my reading of the story. So we're going to have... Right. But your stayed, vision, stayed good. great. My hairline, awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you got to pick right. and choose in this life, you know, and, and well, we can't all have everything. No, but we can have a wonderful mm. discussion of Assassin's Apprentice uh, because uh, I, yeah, I definitely have totally different opinion on it. Having read this time, I think that uh, it'll be interesting to get into the, uh, like the main aspects of the book here i know we've also talked about the idea of doing an episode that kind of focuses on the context of when this book was published and the role that it's played in fancy history especially modern fancy history because uh, what's most interesting to me coming back now that i'm more well read in fantasy and i have a lot more context than i did when i was Uh, first reading it is this book was published on april 1st (laughs) that's no april fools for you charles that's not it's this is real it's not april fools that this book was published april 1st 1995 uh and to put that in uh, place of its history that means it predates a game of thrones by actually over a year so I was talking to you about this a while back, Charles, but I was, I was wrong. I thought they were published in the same year. No, Assassin's Apprentice was published before book one of A Song of Ice and Fire by over a year. A Song of Ice and Fire's first book, A Game of Thrones, was published August 1st, 1996. Wow. So this book is an absolute trailblazer totally different than a lot of what was being published back in the 90s i mean we're still in the realm of a lot like tolkien clones and that kind of stuff very revolutionary and i well i think it is important to to couch our conversation of this book within that context i think uh it also there's so much to get into we could 
end up spending the whole episode <laughs> right, discussing right. that if we wanted to. So we'll try to keep this one more of a discussion and deep dive into the book itself. And we'll save too much of the like context and oh, why we think it's so impressive that this book was published yeah. during that time. I mean, it was uh, pre-Grimdark uh, yeah. boom, you know, and another everything episode. like was it was a totally different yeah. world out there in the fantasy genre. And something that I agree, Dylan, it's important to keep in mind as we have this discussion. Because I think there's a lot to talk about, not just about the book, but some of the common reception of the book as well. And I had the same thought as you reading this. I was like, wow, 1995. Like, I'm thinking like early Wheel of Time books were in the early 90s. And and a couple other like of those big mm-hmm. serial fantasy pulp novels were very popular in the 90s too and then you get and like there was some sci-fi stuff but and then you get this and you're like wow this is like the precursor to something like a patrick rothfuss who came into the scene like 20 years later or something like that when actually i for 10 Uh, yeah like it's been it's been 20 it feels like we're still in the middle of it but that first book came out a long time ago now from rothfuss too so i had to like adjust the math there i think it was like 2000 it might have been 2007 Uh, but we can we can look that up but the idea is it's over a decade Mm -hmm. later and that's it's pretty interesting because i remember i the first time i read assassin's apprentice was actually around the same time that i read the name of the wind book one of patrick Mm rothfuss's king killer chronicle and uh, like a there's a lot of similarities between Mm -hmm. the two in terms of the the premise, the framing device of the story and all that. But I, I think at that time, like, I just saw them as, like, these are two books that I picked up around the same time. And you don't realize, like, oh, wow, one of these books came out over a decade before mm-hmm. the other. And there's, there's something worth appreciating about right. that. And uh, especially when you read more of like, oh, this was what came out around the same time and this stuff came way later and this stuff came before. You're like, oh, wow, this is really impressive that Robin Hobb was able to write a yeah. story like this. Like it's not some wacky quest with a fellowship and all that kind of stuff. It's this like really personal intimate story of a character who is dealing with being a bastard in a royal court and you might say oh why would i read about that when i could just read about Jon snow and you could Game of not Thrones. well you couldn't <laughs> yeah. in 1995 okay this is pre- this is what you had. Snow. but you and, did have but, yeah you know it, it, and it's also interesting right. it's like it, it's kind of revolutionary in the fantasy genre anyway to make your main character someone with a lot of struggles and not necessarily high charisma, high likability. He his he has potential for all of those things, but just it's a depressing tale. And so that in itself, when you're used to like, oh, I'm just a humble shepherd from the two rivers, but I'm also over six feet tall and have blue eyes and exotic red hair and I'm super muscly and everyone likes me and I'm the chosen one and I have all this magic and I can do, I'm super unique and that makes me hold court with kings from all over the world. It's like, no, that's not the <laughs> character that you get in this story. It's not like the chosen one that gets to go on an adventure. He's He just gets thrust into a court that in a society that does not respect him or does not support him and then that's just his life and we get to read about that you know so it's like interesting choices from Hobb to make a character like that you would think you just want a likable adventure story and that's not really what you get here and that kind of makes it revolutionary on its own because when you think about it you were right Dylan um Name of the One came out in March 27th 2007 so almost 12 years like with just a few days oh yeah uh to time difference and there's not too many stories like it in between and that makes me want to say that Hobb was ahead of her time and especially given that her prose is so like oh yeah beautiful and modern and and fresh and readable and not dated in any way that leads me to say it's ahead of its time you know with game of thrones like shortly after that you got a bunch of other like grim dark stories within a year of it you know it, it took a while for this kind of vein of fantasy to get another really popular story um in name of the wind i i I am hesitant to suggest that there's another book like it that came out in between and i'm sure there are some but none to the 
notoriety of these two stories. And that, to me, it's unusual to get a gap that large, you know. For sure. And it's it's a rarefied air when you start talking about prose of Hob, and then even, for, for me, Rothfuss as the the prose that I think I is would the best in the genre, agree. or at least that I personally enjoy the most of any writer in the genre. But uh, you are definitely on point with this. Like her prose, Robin Hobb's prose is so mm-hmm. timeless and reads so easily with a modern audience. And it's, I don't know how she managed it where it doesn't feel dated at all. There are, there are a few that manage to do that like we, we talk about Ursula K. Le Guin who is a totally different yeah. writing style but uh, she also writes in in a way though it has this sort of campfire mm-hmm. story feel to fairy it. tale folk tale kind of thing and it just reads from the so late 60s well. dude 68 yeah, and, <laughs> yeah yeah Ursula K. Le Guin another one that definitely deserves to be on the Mount Rushmore for fantasy authors. And, and yeah, this kind of feels to, to to bring up Ursula K. Le Guin, this feels like a, like a wizard of earth. They almost could feel sort of like a predecessor to the assassin's apprentice. And then in turn, we could say that King Killer Chronicle is like the following suit in this line of, of these books where all of them kind of tell the tale of like in one way or another, like brash youths who uh, we know from the start of Assassin's Apprentice when he's talking about like uh, his story. He's like, yeah. this is tragic. Yeah. Things have gone yeah. really bad for me. I write with and my you get knuckly that fingers in, and this and that, uh, you know, you're like, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right the name of the wind obviously starts in a in a similar manner where you get these like tragic heroes telling their own account and this like framing device uh, uh to this point we don't get a lot of like fitz's current right. life uh in the present but we get a um like occasional moments where he's like uh kind of describing how his life is now and it doesn't sound great uh but we also get his perspective on like, oh, I was like this as a youth and I didn't understand this, didn't understand that. And there's so much of that in The Name of the Wind as well. Uh, so, you know, it's cool to see a book that if, if it didn't directly inspire uh, Patrick Rothfuss's uh, Name of the Wind, one of my favorite books ever. Uh, it, we do know, like we've seen online that Rothfuss has a lot of positive things to say about her, like, or <laughs> well, about her too, but uh, also yes. about Robin Hobb. And, They've uh, met yeah, it, and it, it's really you know, cool. Rothfuss describes it as like a fanboy yeah. kind of interaction. So you, you know that there's a little bit going on there. Um, and I, yeah, I agree. It, it's, Really interesting. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to diving into the actual plot points to kind of bring some of these things home. But before we do that, Dylan, you got to give one of your famous spoiler warnings. I do. Yeah, we're going to get into the deep depths of a discussion on Assassin's Apprentice, book one of the Farseer trilogy here. Uh, and that means that, uh, hey, if you haven't yet read the books after assassin's apprentice Mm -hmm. you're fine no we're not going to get into those don't you worry i haven't even read (laughs) the ones after this so we couldn't spoil it for you even if we wanted to well charles could if he really wanted to but he won't and i can't yeah and that means that hey (laughs) you're cool you're good here if you've only read book one but if you have not yet read book one and you don't want any of that spoiled. You don't want Assassin's Apprentice spoiled for mm. you. you got to read it. All right? If you fall into that camp, then now's a good time to turn this down in your headphones because we're going to get into that no hold bar discussion of Assassin's that Apprentice. That we are. So let's go ahead and just jump right into it. We're at the beginning of Assassin's Apprentice. And yeah, that framing device is so fascinating. You've got older fits writing about mm-hmm. his life and that's the frame that we get and you get that this is a tragic character and you get that he's been weathered down and this and that and he's 
finally putting his tail to the page. And right away, this first thing that happens, like the first memory that he can recall to record in the story of his life is being given away at six years old by his maternal grandfather. And he doesn't have any memories of his mother. So this is, make no mistake, from the beginning, a very sad tale. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting the choice here to have his first memories come mm-hmm. at six because to, to bring a little of my psych background mm-hmm. in, typically it's around age two and a half that our first memories mm-hmm. come from. So there's there's some sort of, and, and I mean intuitively, you don't need to be like, uh, you, you don't need to know much more than your own personal experience to know. You probably have memories <laughs> before six. So it's an interesting choice for Robin Hobb to have Fitz not remember anything mm-hmm. before that. Uh, I, uh, there's nothing really revealed as to why that's the case, at least to this point. Um, but it's a great place to start the story because it's when Fitz goes from like a six-year-old boy who has lived a presumably pretty non-miraculous life to completely changing the outlook of the whole kingdom and royal court just based on the fact that he exists Mm -hmm. and it's like kind of interesting the way that robin hobb writes it her prose is so great uh she has a line and i don't don't have it in front of me but it's basically like uh if i had done absolutely nothing with my uh, life at all just my mere (laughs) existence like completely upended history (laughs) right right because you're the bastard son of the king in waiting who is known to be chivalrous and virtuous and this and that and it's his his name name is is literally literally chivalry chivalry. (laughs) i don't know it's it's interesting you you build this and then chivalry abdicates the throne and and then verity takes over it's an interesting premise and it brings me back to when king shrewd you know went to fitz the boy at the time and was like now here's a bastard what are you gonna do with them you know like they can be a useful tool if you treat them well you know like that kind of which is such a great scene literally just the six-year-old fitz like in the just like stealing food in in the court and it's like what and he's like yeah you know if you treat them right they can be loyal to you they can be useful tools it's all a matter of what you decide to do with them or they could be a very dangerous thing and that's kind of the setup that we get for Fitz's entire existence basically yeah and we know that shade who is the uh, titular mm-hmm. assassin <laughs> to which uh, mm-hmm. Fitz is apprenticed uh, is a bastard as well and i believe if i'm remembering correctly the older half brother Correct. of our current Correct. king shrewd so yeah that's uh, shrewd has has learned from experience that people can can be very useful uh, mm-hmm. when they're bastards if you if you put them to work in the right way usually in these uh, shady yeah. underground ways yeah and uh anyway i found the quote by the way uh, so uh it's I was mentioning earlier about him changing the outlook of the world is like, and so I came to Buckkeep, sole child and bastard of a man I'd never know. Prince Verity became king in waiting and Prince Regal moved up a notch in the line of succession. If all I had ever done was to be born and discovered, I would have left a mark across all the land for all time. I grew up fatherless and motherless in a court where all recognized me as a catalyst and a catalyst Mm. I became. And that's just the what a great way one. that chapter one closes <laughs> out. And it's like, isn't it? It's like, that's what we mean when we're talking about how impressive Hobbes' prose is. It's just like, uh, she, obviously all of these events were happening, but she just has a way of like conveying what it means uh, that this like this kid is just like totally just like destroying the line of succession (laughs) and changing everything by his mere existence and she can say it so much more Mm. eloquently and in a way that ominously too for us and also like the way it d yeah and the way that it like dehumanizes fits is like everyone just saw me like not as a kid just as a catalyst as something that's like they saw me that way and i became that 
and that is kind of the tragic tale of his yes, whole did. life. Like he could have had any wants, desires, dreams, actions, anything, but just by the nature of being born in this particular situation, made him immediately outcast by everyone. It took its, his parents away from him. It took any kind of rights to a, a childhood, if you will, or any kind of luxury, really. I mean, he was taken care of and trained and everything, but only to be the pawn of someone else and a sacrificial tool, kind of. It's like, will you devote your life to killing for someone else? It's like he didn't really have a choice. And it's kind of interesting in what like this whole book is kind of about is being born on the, this fringe of society and just like society making of you what it wants to and not even giving you a chance or a hope at your own unique life. And, and it's it makes Fitz a very tragic character, but it's, it's such an interesting theme and such an interesting portrayal of it. And it starts right at the end of chapter one. It, it, it's rare and unique and it's makes what makes this book stand out among so many others, especially in the 90s. <laughs> People are like, society's great. Yeah. Well, we're so <laughs> we're used to... We're fantasy writers. Yeah. <laughs> we're used to our... Everything's great. <laughs> our unassuming heroes are usually uh, more assuming than we like to pretend they are, <laughs> in the, especially in the 90s. Like you mentioned, the, the Rand type. It's like, I'm so unassumingly six foot blonde hair, blue eyes, gorgeous with all well, the we'll powers. Right it's like, no, Fitz... Continue. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's fair. I, I apologize. I, I went one step too far. I did uh, I did get the hair wrong, but it's flowing beautiful yes. red hair, you know. It's exotic and for the, th- I think the three that, rivers, for sure. Right. That is uh, that is true. And I think that, like, her willingness to actually double mm-hmm. down on her character's, like, unassumingness, for lack of a better word, or lack of a real word there is is really impressive and it's interesting because he has these like he's well fed he's taken care of and uh, all that but what he completely lacks is any autonomy any ability to make any decisions in his life as to Mm -hmm. how his life will go so there's even the moment where oh, I could potentially be a scribe's apprentice. Like a guy wants me to like travel with him and be a scribe's apprentice and then I could become a scribe and maybe that's like a future that I could hold and I can get away from all of this. And he tells Shade that and Shade's just like, oh, no, that's like really (laughs) stupid. Like as soon as you're not immediately under the thumb of the king, (laughs) he will kill you. (laughs) Like someone will kill you. Like, yeah, the king shrewd might be nice to you right now, but that's because you're completely Mm. his pawn. And yeah, if you go away and try to live even a completely normal life of a scribe's apprentice, which you have Mm. the knack for, you could. That's why the scribe wants you to do it. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Can't do it. You will die. So Uh, true. And even when he tries to have any of his own relationships or do anything resembling a normal, loving life, it gets almost crushed beneath him. And I have to bring up at this point Bridge, the stable master, who takes yeah. in Fitz when there's no place for him. Like the his dad, Chivalry, never lays eyes on him and abandons him. No one in the royal family wants him. He's too young to be useful yet. So who watched him? The guy who watches the animals and, and like the horses and the dogs because, you know, one, he's got this relationship with Chivalry that we can get into, but two, because that's just where this kid lands in society was sleeping on straw in the stables when he first arrived at court you know it's just to show you um his first relationships and he ends up developing this weird father figure but not really relationship with Burrich and as cold as it is and complicated as it is what Hobb does throughout this book that I love is it's also somehow so beautiful, you know, and and there's moments that shine through where they have this intimate relation, father-son relationship 
that they will drop their facade and recognize every once in a while. And it's just so powerful. And I think one of Hobbes' major strengths in the story, because I do want to get into some of the criticisms maybe after we go through more of the plot of the story, but what she is able to do, well, maybe it's not action-packed and happy and entertaining on its face all the time, But you're getting these really, really interesting character relationships that you just don't get typically in stories. They're not romanticized. They're not dramatized. They're like real and ugly and complicated. Like Birch will hit him, will make him sleep in the straw. And then you'll have these moments of caring for him and loving for him too. And just how we go in and out of that is masterful. And I love the Birch Birch its relationship especially you know um towards the end of this book but even in the beginning you're like okay i I see something happening here yeah it's it's so true charles the this complicated relationship between the two of them you just didn't see that getting like a, a sort of fatherly relationship being this uh, complicated and that's such a mixed way of viewing each other because i mean from burke's perspective like he has trouble seeing fits especially at first as anything but like the reason why his uh, you know why chivalry i mean what his relationship to chivalry is i guess they always call him chivalry's man yeah, right like he obviously cared a lot for chivalry and then this kid is like a symbol of why chivalry is not going to be king and chivalry is not even here and eventually chivalry is mm. dead and that's it's hard to get past that so you can know he's holding on to this this bitterness and he's but he also knows he's supposed to care for this kid and he like holds on to this like he's a piece of chivalry looks exactly it, like him, him you so know that kind him. of thing so it's like it's that chivalry <laughs> looks that? exactly like chivalry and oh, that exactly like it. Yeah. adds a layer to his relationships with certain people that i find really interesting and it For helps sure. to know that it's a device where Definitely. it's like there's no denying it right like you can't be like oh that grand that crazy grandpa dragging that six-year-old around was lying you know there's no blood test that you can do like there's no magical way to prove it but the fact that they look and act very similarly um is kind of that clue and that hangs on birch too it's kind of interesting he likes chivalry so much that he's willing to take on the role of a parental figure for his bastard son basically you know it's a very selfless act in itself even if he's not maybe the most caring loving father figure in the world he still accepts willingly the act to do that you know and and the way that that relationship changes over time another interesting layer to it we talk about Fitz being just denied happiness is his use of the wit uh, beginning with a young pup named nosy and the wit to me is very fascinating for a lot of reasons And, and i think what i like about it most is we're told right away from birch That the wit is a perversion and you can't use it. And he goes as far as to like beat, you know, beat Fitz for trying to use it. And even seemingly killing Nosy because their bond was getting, yes, seemingly. seemingly. But at the time, you believe it, man. (laughs) I mean, this is I believed it. And when I read it for the first time, I was like, oh my God, he killed that dog. That's crazy. And, and, um, but what I love about the wit is that throughout the book, Like, you're told it's a perversion, but it never once acts that way. Sure, there are times where it's like, I can feel the sensations of the animal calling to me and I want to connect to it. But this is just someone that wants love and to feel love and to be loved. And he loves animals. And it's nothing like what Birch is warning him about. And you never get that, like, throughout the story that it ever becomes like a problem. We only know what we're told and we're told that it's a perversion, but it was never even come close to being tested. And I find that so interesting. It's something that's so meaningful to Fitz and it's been denied to him to the point where he never even got to the point of kind of testing its its limits. That's like a fascinating choice from, from Hobb because even like there's things like in other stories like drugs and poisons and things where you're like i can feel the 
the tremors of it like oh i almost died that's really bad i can't do that bad thing because it almost killed me last time it's like no it's we're told it's a bad thing but we never see it and that's a really interesting component to to the wit and to fitz's relationship with animals yeah and it puts us in a place where we're like yeah. fits where we don't know if this is just rumor and discrimination against people mm-hmm. who have the wit and all that kind of stuff or if he's actually taking a huge risk by getting into the use of the wit and it's it's still unclear by the end of this book and there are moments where it's hinted at like hey like we don't know if this is true like even as as Fitz is kind of writing in the future he's hinting at like people don't really know and has it been tested i don't know so it's it's cool and i think that's one of the aspects of of the hobbs writing in this book is we're so tight to Fitz's yeah. perspective we feel like we are fit in a way that is rarely mm-hmm. accomplished i think in fiction obviously the first person narration helps but i've read lots of first person narrated books and something about this one just really gets you into fits his mindset and i think that's part of the reason why hey this isn't constant action a lot of this is fleshing out fits as a character and his thought processes and his relationships and you get the benefit of those complicated relationships including the fact that i believe it's heavily implied uh, that it, uh burrich has the mm-hmm. ability to use the yep. wit as well uh where there's that moment toward the end where fits is like oh like how how'd you tell that this was going on and he's like did you sense it and he's like oh yeah like i uh, i could kind of tell he's like did you sense it through the use of uh, right. uh, maybe some animals <laughs> right the area? It's, and he kind of like you know it's never explicitly stated no. i think but it's heavily implied and i think that's another one of those aspects where uh, people often hate most the things that they like don't like in themselves when they see them in other people like that's what is most despicable to people is the things right. they don't like about themselves uh, right. display by others so you see that's another layer of Burke's relationship with Fitz and why things are so difficult and complicated between the two of them but there is that love uh, lying They're beneath all of it so it's well really written lovely. and I think a lot of this book is like I consider it an investment like to know a character like Fitz as intimately as we do by the end of the story, you've got to go deep into these story beats, deep into these relationships. And if you want a, a story that's honest and true, it's like exciting, heroic stuff isn't happening to people every single moment of every day. You know, they're not going on adventures and and getting into fights and this and that every minute of every day. So we get a lot of these scenes where he's, waking up in the stables he's getting food he's taking care of the dogs he's going to training it's this it's that and the payoff that you get with some of these relationships is is huge and the impression that you, your connection to fits is, is so deepened by the end that um i just found some of these ending moments like so moving um but before we get there we have another relationship to talk about and that's molly the uh, potential love interest, the candle maker, um, in our in our story, the candle maker's mm. daughter. I mean, a maybe a precursor time, to Charles. to a Denna kind of character. What do we think? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So Denna from the King Killer Chronicle is who you're referring to. Kind of extremely controversial main love interest is what I would call her for quoth in that book and that series and Mm -hmm. one of my favorite characters i think that this relationship between fitz and uh, molly it has a lot of the bare bones of what you end up seeing in the relationship between quoth and denna without getting into uh, you know a lot of people might not have read the king killer chronicle so i won't get into the details of that because not fair to spoil any of that but just the way that they relate to each other and kind of are unable to say exactly how they're feeling to each other and 
like how that has to do with being like misguided youths and also their circumstances and uh, the, the way they kind of like dance around each other. I think uh, it feels very like Quoth and Denna, but like the more generic yeah, brand. It's not a big you know? focus. It's like of there's this story, a lot more, but there's moments that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, the bones are there. The, some of the beats are there, like the stumbling adolescence of like, courting without realizing you're courting overthinking things when like you obviously like each other you know you know things like that that prevent you from being in the relationship um those things are there it's just not a focus and it's just as far as all of these relationships are kind of nurtured throughout the story that one it takes a little bit of a side seat, I would say, but still a lot of interest there, a lot of potential to try and see Fitz attempt to have a normal interaction with someone that doesn't know who he is, you know, and or anything about the the nature of his his birth. Yeah, don't get me wrong. There are some good moments between those two. There's the moment where he's trying to protect her from Mm -hmm. her father and ends up using his, uh, uh, presumably, Mm -hmm. the skill uh, to knock the guy unconscious and, uh, like, protect Molly by doing that. And then Molly doesn't know that, how could she possibly know that the reason her dad, like, suddenly went unconscious has anything Mm -hmm. to do with Fitz. And then they, like, help the guy home. Because he's, like, this drunk who beats her. Mm -hmm. He's a terrible dude. But Molly still takes care of him, which uh, obviously is a thing that feels very realistic as well. Like, there are uh, relationships like that where uh, parents are abusive, and sadly, and then kids take on a sort of, like, nurturing parental role. And it's it's Mm -hmm. really well written and depicted by... By hop, but anyway, yeah, that moment, and also the moment where uh, where Fitz reads uh, the thing that uh, Molly's mom left them, like all those kind of stuff. Oh, there's yeah. there's some good moments. I love the way that Hob describes like Fitz's view of Molly as almost as like mm-hmm. refuge, uh, where it's like I can escape from all of that just for a second and be like normal with this other person who doesn't know I'm freaking yeah. Royal bastard. Uh, but it, another way in which it's interesting and, and feels like it's a uh, precursor to a <laughs> quote and Dana relationship is from the very start, both of those relationships have like the main character who obviously says something of a frame story. Cause we do have a, uh, uh, you know, a a very limited amount of time, but uh, some time where we're in the present Fitz's Mm -hmm. point of view, uh, and then he's framing it with the story he's writing for you. Uh, We get constant, like, constantly it's implied that this did not go well. (laughs) As is everything. This whole situation did not go well for me. (laughs) Right. But in, in particular, the relationship... As well with Molly, he he does a lot of implying it does not go well. And uh, there's a lot of that with, yeah, Quoth's overall Mm -hmm. story Mm -hmm. as well. Uh, And maybe Quoth's Quoth's emphasis on the Denna aspect of his story, I would say, is greater than a bit more romanticized on the Molly (laughs) aspects of the story. Yeah. And you won't get Fitz, like, completely waxing poetic too much. Oh, There's yeah. the occasional moment. There's the occasional moment where he goes into, like, and the color of her eyes. Like, how could I even yeah. describe that yeah. to you? And that's so You get cool that he's, like, ask. still in love with her. But he her, doesn't you know? do it There's quite as much of as that, cool. Like, that yeah. infatuation that comes with a first love. And, yeah, one of the things that I was kind of appreciating on my... This is my second read of it, but... I kind of got this idea in my head, and I talked about it a little earlier about this theme of just being born in a place in society and society just keeping you there, um, and how you choose to kind of live in that, it live in that place society puts you. And then I started to think about how other characters in the story are doing this, a similar thing, and, and Molly's an interesting one to think about, where like she's born into a situation she's got an abusive father born pretty poor this and that but she keeps a very 
upbeat attitude. She's very caring and nurturing, and she's very enterprising as well. She runs the whole shop. You know, she dresses in bright colors and and things like that. And and it makes sense why someone like Fitz would maybe be attracted to that and enamored by that. This idea that there is, you can be born in a shitty situation and still have a positive outlook on life and be enterprising and be caring and nurturing. And and, and it, it's a subtle thing that I didn't pick up you know, my first read through and who even knows if it was a direct intention from Robin Hobb, but it certainly seems to be like part of the reason why these two characters get along so well and why Fitz may be so enamored with Molly. And it's these subtle relationship dynamics that are just so rich in this story that in a lot of other fantasy books where obviously the point is very different. Like if you're just like this rogue character with knives under your sleeve and you're killing someone every chapter, it's like you read, it's a different level than what we're getting here with these intimate character interactions. And rarely is an author so willing to explore relationships and characters so intimately uh, than hop. That's well said, Charles. I think what you're getting at makes a lot of sense. Anytime that I see characters that have romantic interest in each other, you want to step back and say, okay, why? What what attracts this character to that character and vice versa? And there's times where uh, there's all sorts of ways this can play out, right? There's times where you're just like, I don't understand <laughs> why these two characters are together at all. I guess this author just wanted them to be together. There's times where you're like, oh, I could see why these characters would make sense, but there's no development of their relationship. It just kind of happens. Uh, and then there's times where it's like, oh, I totally get what these two have in common, and it's slowly kind of fleshed out, and it's especially done well when it's subtle, like the way Hobb does it, where uh, there's no moment where Fitz is just like uh, and like both me and Molly have these elements of being stuck in our <laughs> lives and that's why right. we have this in common and we really bond over that in particular but it's like they do that like it's uh, <laughs> uh, it's occurring, but it's occurring uh, like in a more uh, sh- show don't tell mm-hmm. kind of way and uh, you know we've read other books uh, uh, even recently where it's like explicitly stated to the reader like this is why these two characters should be together and belong sure, together and sure. it makes sense and like uh in the case i'm referring to recently it did make sense but it also didn't have to you, know, you didn't have to hit us over <laughs> right. over the head with it uh this time it was not molly was an that's immortal being Hob never that she never and this and that. <laughs> 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 well, there's more books, Charles. I haven't read them yet. So That's who knows? true, but it's. But no, I totally get it. Yeah, it's. It's. A you're talking. You're picking up on something that I and it's very totally subtle. agree with Robin Hobb, and this is that show don't tell like deep exploration aspect. Another example that I was reading and admiring um, was when Fitz first meets Lady Patience, Chivalry's uh, widow. And you don't even know who she is yet. The scene plays out. Fitz walks into the kitchen and this woman is there and sees her. And the description is like she reacts like she saw a ghost and she like went pale and like took a step Mm. back. And then as the interaction goes on, she's like, are they feeding you? Are they taking care of you? like asking these almost like mothering kind of questions, you know, and then only much later did Fitz put together that that was Lady Patience. And it, it's such a brilliant right. scene because it does, she never said that, oh, I, rea- I acted like I saw a ghost because you look exactly like my ex-husband. <laughs> it's just like, who, not my ex-husband, who my dead. husband who died. So therefore, it would be a ghost. <laughs> yeah, if I yeah saw exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I didn't know that you were the bastard was here and was going to come and see me, you know? And even if you, I didn't know if I would recognize you if I saw you, you know, so much happened in in that moment. And yes, Fitz acknowledges it and puts the pieces together, but there's a lot that she leaves unsaid and and lets the character kind of show you that you get this relationship between Fitz and Patience very early on, that Patience accepts this kind of mothering role to Fitz because she sees her 
husband in him. She always wanted to give chivalry an heir and never could. And now here's an innocent child that's on the outside of society being mistreated. And she was on the outside of society before she was married to chivalry and now afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. And it's all of those things spinning. Like somehow Hobb managed to weave into a story where if you had me try and write something where that was happening, it would be way more sloppy. And I don't even know how she does it, but she <laughs> spins all the plates and she puts that scene together and it just works. And it's you end up being endeared to Lady Patience because she has her moments of humanity where she's like, you're the bastard. It should have been me that had the child that looked like chivalry, not you. Like, just mm -hmm. by being born to look like your husband when you couldn't give him a child is a huge slap in the face for a queen, right? So those kind of things are just, are just speak to that show aspect you were talking about, and, and they're incredible. Totally. All of Fitz's relationships are complicated and intricate and well fleshed out mm. because of that nothing's just like straightforward and that's why we do uh, we get a lot of time with all of them where they're getting fleshed out because there's so much to show about these complicated relationships with mixed and ambiguous feelings about each other i mean you get it with uh barrack when it comes to paternal relationships you get it with patience when it comes to maternal mm. relationships and we also get it uh with especially verity and uh, uh and then to a totally different extent <laughs> regal with these almost uh i don't know what the right word is for like <laughs> uncle <laughs> when it comes to, like paternal maternal what is uncle <laughs> right. in that sense but like uh these weird like uncle relationships and and in some ways almost like fraternal relationships yeah. like brotherly in some ways like it, you could say that uh, it can feel at times like verity is like the older brother to fitz and then other ways it, like regal is like the uh, like the wicked uh, <laughs> right. stepbrother right. like sort right. of thing right but uh, yeah we get we get all those relationships are are complicated except maybe regal because that's pretty <laughs> uncomplicated that regal yeah. hates fits and wants right him eliminated. kind of a selfish boy that can aid him. And, and what's yeah. and again that exercise i was talking about it being like how people are who society forces upon them like what makes regal kind of like a good antithesis to fits is that here's someone mm. who's also See where you're going arguably like a bastard like a step in the family but on the other side of the coin where he's in the noble line and society's like this one was the bastard but this one is the third in line to the throne and he gets to grow up being spoiled doted on by his mother who fits never had that relationship you know they're almost like perfect opposites in terms of privilege and parental supervision and like society's views on who they are and so when they come together it's kind of fascinating to see like you root for fits but uh regal has all the cards you know so it's, it's kind of interesting to see how those two mm -hmm duke it out yeah you know? it makes it good when you think of like a villain i guess an antithesis to our main character regal fits the bill for sure and it's another one of those moments where i think regal sees the parts of himself that he most hates and fits mm -hmm. it's like you have this royal blood yeah. but you're not like the the real like king and waiting level royal everyone and likes your I dad feel like everyone it hates my mom you know <laughs> like... yeah <laughs> <laughs> right who is by the way right the names i know that they have like meaning in the story in terms of like you name your kid mm -hmm. in the royal lines and stuff you name your kids what you want them to be like emblematic of in terms mm -hmm. of their character but it's kind of like, I know they kind of imply, oh, maybe there's some <laughs> sort of magic at play here, which is why they become like that. But it is also kind of like, why would you name your, the queen is Queen Desire. <laughs> right. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, and then that's a Regal's mom is Queen yeah. Desire. It's like, why would you go for that one? That's the best like, virtue they could come up with. And then, of course, she <laughs> is the like 
you know, like greedy, like power grubbing queen that wants her kid to rise through the line of succession at any cost. And maybe she killed chivalry and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't have gone desire in that case. And it's funny how all the characters like do just completely, at least to this point, like align with their name. Like shrewd is shrewd. Uh, chivalry was chivalrous and you know maybe he made one mistake but he was chivalrous uh verity is very honest and uh regal is he regal he does portray a like regal bearing to those around him like fitz sees him for who he is but he he definitely has the appearance of a uh like very princely person so i think that's that's kind of fair yeah patience pretty patient it seems yeah like. i mean Maybe. it's funny because she deals with fits as like emo <laughs> teenager stuff she does well. but what i love is there's these moments where all these characters have like their their failures it's kind of funny to see where with patience she's <laughs> like i'm gonna train you to be a noble kid like learn like learn the pipes and he's just not getting it and, and Bir- birch is like uh he can't talk to him have a real conversation without him like cleaning a saddle or something it's like these moments where they try <laughs> to do something and fail it, it, it almost makes them a little more more endearing and, and patience certainly is you know putting up with like a lot of stuff in court and this and that but i mean it, it's kind of like a bit of a nothing name for a a character that's been kind of ostracized by society i get that a little bit too it's like eh, she's not really that patient but also like who cares <laughs> yeah it's like you know like she's just lady patience like she's not even in like within court society that much she like barely counts anymore so kind of interesting to see how that all plays out and uh yeah i, I mean that's just the beginning we we've got um shade is a character i guess we could talk about um another here's someone who kind of is almost like looking in the mirror for fits it's an interesting reveal that you could probably guess before it's revealed that shade was a bastard himself and this is like the cautionary tale look in the mirror kind of interaction that fits is having with with shade this idea that like you pledge your life to the king. You have all these talents and skills, but no one knows who you are. No one recognizes you. And you get chewed up like by doing it. I mean, Che does go on to say, like, I chose this for myself. Like, he deliberately says that. But you still get the sense that, like, hey, you are older than Shrewd. In another world, you could have been king. And now you're, like, all chewed up in a dungeon somewhere like doing all the busy work essentially (laughs) with none of the fame (laughs) yeah yeah if the busy work is killing people then court intrigue too he's doing um, the busy work dressing up as um oh god what was the yeah but what was her name lady Lady, uh oh shoot it's on the tip of my tongue what was the name no uh but um the poisoner he developed that nasty old lady and character who like would fill up yeah. the chamber pots that was one of the known things about her you know it's like hilarious <laughs> um but lady shoot lady we're gonna yeah, have to, we'll have to do some Googling. for now charles i'm not gonna remember it but yeah he's uh it's pretty clear at points like he even starts talking about bastards where he's like oh yeah like bastards they get treated like this and at one point i think even well before the reveal he's like yeah we're just not seen as like part of the court or blah blah like he just throws that in there and fitz doesn't even comment on it and then later he finally pieces it together. lady time so, lady time yeah it's it's not <laughs> yeah. lady time there we go it's kind of, that's a good name for yeah. a poisoner, right? Like Father Time yeah. is undefeated. And Time, like T H Y M E, like an their... herb, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. Pretty, Pretty clever, clever that shade. Again, this is pre Tyrion, I want to say. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, definitely an interesting character. He's not for for him being the like character who this is most named after besides Fitz, like right. this book. <laughs> Cuz he's the assassin. Sure, Fitz is Assassin's Apprentice, so you you Mm -hmm. give him the nod in terms of really being the titular character. But I don't know. It's a kind of odd name for the book, right? It's catchy. It seems pretty... It's catchy. It seems pretty, like, secondary to what's going... Like, it's more important that he's the bastard than that he's the assassin's yeah, you apprentice. You can't really call it like thing, the human I guess doormat. It doesn't, you can't call it like... <laughs> doesn't have quite the, the same doormat. ring to it. Well, I'm thinking like the yeah. royal bastard or something. Yeah. Like it Dude, it's work. 1995. But you like came from a bastard on the cover. Come on. No. I mean, it's not till we got Scott Lynch you can't and now. the gentleman bastards or in the mid-2000s that we could pave right. the way for putting bastard on the cover. But even that wasn't the title of the book. So, you know, we still have a ways to go. I think there's like Jonathan French has a book called like The Gray Bastards or something like that. You can do it now, but you couldn't do it in the 90s. And that's fair. And it doesn't sound as good. Like yeah. you want to sell some, Apprentice you move some nice. paper. It's got like, alliteration. Yeah, it moves paper for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, but I don't know. Chade is, he's still like yeah. pretty secondary yeah. as a character. He, what I like is like Fitz is learning some pretty important lessons. It's like, hey, there's ways to navigate society and live kind of outside of where it's placing you. If you're willing to sacrifice like some a couple a few things like your pride and this and that, like you can have really important influences on the world. And Fitz kind of has to weigh this choice of like, is it worth it? <laughs> you know, like is this something I want to do or is this something I'm doing because I don't have a choice? And the dialogue kind of goes back and forth. It's like you're a king's man. You're sworn to the king and the king is always like have i held up my side of the bargain for you and this and that but then on the other side it's like i feel like sometimes he feels like he has the option to to do something else with his life and is tempted in some way so it 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 kind of touches on the nuances of all of that and i find that fascinating and Che does have really good advice about like keeping a cool head and waiting and like don't assume anything you don't know for sure and like take a little bit of abuse if it means to like you can learn something and get the upper hand later. Like these kinds of important lessons that are kind of cool to read about and see in in this story because you have someone like Regal who doesn't know any of those things is just plowing through life and it, it kind of is funny to see the lessons learned being like failing upwards kind of in Regal's case. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I think that Fitz, he's kind of a sponge who goes around right, absorbing right. lessons and information from everyone around him. And that's the only way in which he has a chance to survive. Like, he has to take in a lot of lessons from Shade, but he also, of course, learns a lot from Beric and from Lady Patience and he's and from Verity as well. So he's kind of uh, this, like, hodgepodge of different people's influences and you see it playing out at times and it, it lets him he's he's more clever than i think oh, he yeah. gets credit for when you think about fancy protagonists he gets a uh, you called him human doormat what the the door what human doormat, doormat. doormat the the human doormat yeah i think that's his reputation fancy and in certain ways it's it's certainly well earned and i'll have to see what happens in the following books but in other ways you're like oh he has a few moments where he's pretty clever or he figures things out and a lot of his doormatiness comes from his like how often he is in that position you describe charles where it's like He's damned if he does. He's mm-hmm. damned if he doesn't. That's so frequent. Like, it's interesting in, when he's in the mountain kingdom and he's like, I like, he figures out basically what like Regal's yeah. plot is for the most part. He's slightly off, which leads to issues for him. But he just like, it's like, oh, wow. If I don't poison the prince, then I die in this way. 
And if I do poison the prince, yeah. then I die in that well, Even way. like the night like, before, it's like oh, Regal gave me an screwed. order to just kill this guy when it's so obvious that we have more to yeah. gain by not killing him. Do I do what's right for the realm and not kill him or do I follow um, Regal? And I have to follow Regal because he's the only royal around. And But I know that he's like the most arrogant one around too. So it's like that... that, that issue that he has to weigh with himself that damn if you do damn if you don't situation it was well constructed by by hob at the end there where it's like what do you do when regal tells you to do something and you can't you can't like verify with either shrewd or verity beforehand you know it puts it puts fits in a very difficult spot definitely does and he's just constantly in those ridiculously difficult spots so i think I don't know. I want to. I get a little defensive of Fitz with the doormat stuff, where I see it, and oh, there's yeah. a lot of moments. Like, what like about that, when he goes to that like, Lord's Manor he, and talks the wife into giving up the jewels to put more Watchmen in the towers, and like he like incepted yeah. her basically to be like, "Oh, I had a dream <laughs> that you get like a beautiful woman yeah. gave up her jewels <laughs> on a tower and said." oh let these jewels go towards keeping our city safe and then all the people loved her you know like that was kind of fast and he saves the dog too which is kind of another funny sub which is good because there's a lot of dog death going on in this i came book, to Charles. a realization reading this that there's a point i wanted to make and we'll talk about the dog deaths right let's just cut to that because you brought it up and i had this thought and i'm curious what you think i think we need to have this unwritten rule in movies and fiction where you get one you get one dog death <laughs> like you're john wick you your there. marley and me you know you kill one and spoilers <laughs> for marley and me <laughs> whatever it's a famous movie that's very we're having sad. a no holds barred conversation <laughs> you know, with marley and me you kill one and i guess early but it's like one of the first scenes in john yes. wick it kicks off the whole thing they killed his dog and that was the last straw what's the like famous old book like it's so, like old, old yeller, yeller or something like that like um, something there's another famous dog like, death book you get one and hob Somehow, it feels like she killed three. She killed two, but she killed one twice. So it's like, <laughs> she, she puts you through that three times. Right. It's like, wow, I couldn't think of another story where they killed three pets throughout the book. They just make you suffer. But that last one, that idea of like, dogs don't grieve like humans do, and humans grieve for years. Oh, yeah, like, I've got that Oh, my quote. God, that was so sad. Yeah, I've got that one, Smithy, Charles. Um, not Smithy. Uh, what's his face? Nosy. Nosy. Yes, saves Nosy. Fits from drowning. Somehow, I mean that whole scene where it's yeah. like somehow I had bite marks all in my sleeves, and I don't know how he did it, but he did, and like, oh man, it is just so heartbreaking and so well written that. I mean, you got to give it up to Hob for that. How you could read that and say this book is mid, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> this book is mid. Uh, yeah, so that that's like the last the last passage before the epilogue. It's how he did it, I will never know, but his head still rested on my chest when they found us. His mortal bonds this world had broken. Nosy was dead. I believe he gave his life freely, recalling that we had been good to one another when we were puppies. Men cannot grieve as dogs do, but we grieve for mm. many years. That is so well written, especially because in the yeah, it's a callback to yeah. He said like uh, previously, like dogs grieve a lot more intensely, and like we sh we men don't grieve as dogs do, and we should count ourselves lucky for that. Like, there's that whole thing. But then, like, she flips it on its head while being like, well, yeah, men don't grieve as dogs do, but we grieve for many years, and I'm, like, older now, and I've been grieving this whole time. Like, that is, I don't know. She's just got a way of of writing that she can hit you so oh, hard yeah. with some of those phrases, and, and she just nails it there, and... 
props to her. As as for the the this book is is mid <laughs> takes. Are we getting by into it? <laughs> maybe we. Yeah, maybe we Let's should get it. into that a little bit. And let me start because this is my second time reading this book as well. And I've said in earlier episodes and, and hinted at earlier in this episode that I had a lot more appreciation for the book, thinking in its context and and rereading now. And I think that so, – so let me just start at at the top. When I first read this book – let's say over a decade ago, I read it around like, well, it was one of my earlier adult fantasy books that I've read. And I read it around reading like a game of Thrones and reading King Killer Chronicle and, and reading a, a big one for me was mm-hmm. the Chatham voyage mm-hmm. by Robert V.S. Reddick, friend of the show. And all these books have like a ton going on, a lot more action. You know, maybe it was around like when I read lies of Lock Lamora too. It's like, and then you read a book like this, especially a book like this called Assassin's mm-hmm. Apprentice. And then it's like, I don't know. I came away the first time I read this being like, everyone says this is so amazing. Like, I, I didn't dislike it. I didn't think it was bad. But I was like, I don't know what I'm missing that everyone mm-hmm. else seems to love so much about it. And I think I would agree with a lot of like back then I would have agreed with a lot of folks if they said, you know, it's kind of boring. <laughs> And now I think I'm coming at it with my fresh eyes that can't <laughs> see very well. Uh, but I was wearing That's glasses good. when I read this. So I did, you know, I, I did perceive all the words. And I think now, A, there's the context, which we'll get into more in that future episode we'll, we'll do. But just like thinking about what else was written mm-hmm. at this time, it's like, oh, wow, I can't believe she wrote a story like this. But B, I think I'm a little bit more ready at this point for my fantasy to be slower like intricate character yeah. studies yeah. in this way like just to really get to know Fitz and his worldview and what it's like to be him and how he relates these other characters and how they relate to him I mean we fleshed all that out so much in this episode i think that that's where this book really shines and when you come into this book like i think i did the first time and you're like assassin's apprentice like let's read about a badass assassin who gets trained and then kills people a lot and stuff and then you read this and you're like right what (laughs) like i think that a big reason why that happens for people is that it doesn't align with expectations and it didn't align with my initial expectations uh, the first time I read it, and it didn't work as well for me the sec- as it did. Uh, That's time. well said, Dylan. You know, I've been dealing with these kind of criticisms for this book for a while, and although I wholeheartedly disagree with them, I never begrudge the person for thinking that way. My response is always like, I get it, but it's not that kind of story. You know, it's hard for a story like this where the, like, it's very, it's, a sad book about a character that just gets marginalized by society and mistreated like their whole life and it's not action-packed they don't do anything super exciting and that would not necessarily be an entertaining story for a lot of people that are reading you know the mines of moria the battle of helms deep or oh mistborn vince flying around you know like all like or a oh, Rand is using magic to kill a whole bunch of people. It's like there's not all of these things that are happening <laughs> uh, in this story. And it doesn't hit a lot of the beats that a lot of its contemporaries hit. So you have to be ready to take on a story that is a bit slower paced, is a bit more depressing, is a bit less action oriented a bit less thrilling and be open to receiving that like i'm scrolling through the goodreads and there's one stars on here throughout and they all say something very similar like here's one that i think is well said Uh, the main character simply meandered around in a seemingly unending training montage with nary a purpose in sight i don't mind a slow build-up but the ideas here while artfully portrayed were still very much in a generic court fantasy mold giving me no incentives to stick around and no payoff to collect rating one star and to some degree i can say that that's fair 
But on the other side, I would say that's not this story. Like the whole point of the story is an intimate introspective of a character who fits this unique like doesn't have a place in society and somehow has to navigate it. And he has these complicated relationships and these complicated moments in his life. And we're just here to like read his story and take it in and feel that emotional connection to the emotional things that happens to him. And if you're just like a action oriented fantasy guy, that's not going to hit. And I get it. And it goes back to, I wouldn't begrudge people that even if I disagree. That's well said, Charles. I think that's that's very fair, and I do come away with a lot of uh, sympathy and empathy uh, for the folks who don't really enjoy this book because it's a book that's not for a lot of people, and it's a book that I had pretty... I don't think I would have been harsh. Like I would not have given it one star. Uh, maybe when I first read it, I might have given it like three which isn't too bad when you consider that Robin Hobb herself on her Goodreads <laughs> profile has a whole thing about like, oh, like I'm so shocked. Yeah, this whole it's a thing. bit it's of like a boomer mentality it's there. Like, I'm shocked that <laughs> I'm shocked that people find two star ratings to be bad. Like I might give a book a two star rating if I liked it, but like it wasn't the best book I ever read. Meanwhile, like if you look at her average rating, she gives things like on average around like yeah. four stars or something. So she's not she actually living up her. to whatever like idea she has of why she should give good books two stars or whatever. <laughs> Could you imagine writing a book uh, and Robin Hobb gives it two stars? That would be devastating. <laughs> And yeah. says I liked it. Like, That's even what the, the worst. That's the worst. Robin? It's like okay, we're gonna give it two stars. Be like, be like, give it two stars and be like, ah, oh, this wasn't for me. Blah blah. It's somehow worse and if she gives it two stars. It's worse and she's that like, she like, it. you write a fantasy novel and then she reviews it and you're like, oh my god, Robin Hobb reviewed my book. Just the fact alone, and then to give it two stars is like, oh jeez, yeah. that hurts. That hurts so bad. <laughs> but you know who it's did have bad. a yeah, positive review mean. for this book is Mark Lawrence, friend of the show. And I read you a piece of his mm. review back when I pitched the story. I kind of want to read it again and get your take on it now that you've like reread the book, just to see like sure. where you're at, because I think he says it really well, and it kind of encapsulates what he what's good. To about this book those best-selling authors they got their finger on the pulse man they know what they're doing (laughs) and uh here it is this is mark lawrence an excerpt from mark lawrence's five-star review of assassin's apprentice robin hobb can write a first-person story with rare skill she shows you a world through fitz's eyes and makes it matter makes it vital some elements of hobb's fantasy are fairly old school but written with a modern style and a literary skill that one almost never used to see in fantasy and is still hard to find in the genre what hobbs does best quite possibly better than every other fantasy writer is build develop and breathe life into relationships she writes great characters that you can believe in but it's in interactions that they truly shine I mean, he nailed what it, right? can you say? I think Mark <laughs> nailed it there. And we've been circling around that for like an hour and 15 minutes and Mark said in like three or four right. sentences. But, you know, there's a reason why that guy's getting getting paid to write awesome books and, and we're rambling for, for hours at a time. So it's, yeah, for free. So I think, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I totally agree. I feel like we've been saying a lot of those things in less eloquent ways. So. So I, if you at home I mean, read and love this book and people are telling you it's mid, just say that to them. Just say, look, she does this better than any other author. She breathes life into relationships through their interactions, right? Which is such a hard thing to do. And she does that mm-hmm. time and time again. Like when Fitz is with Burrich and he's about to go um, on the trial, um, we didn't ever talked about Galen for Galen's trial, right? And... Like, he's like, I'm like, she's like, it's not going to be great. Galen's kind of a dick. Like, this is not like, you're obviously going to be set up to fail. But there's like this one moment where like the dialogue is just like Birch is standing over the fire. He's not even, can't even look Fitz in the eye because he's trying to like, he doesn't know how to process connecting emotionally with Fitz. But the dialogue is just dot, dot, dot. 
worry about you boy like he couldn't even phrase the whole sentence and it's just like oh wow birch is mm. genuinely concerned of that this kid is going to get killed on this adventure and it it was a fantastic scene it was so touching and to write like an incomplete sentence as your heart felt like that's the line moment it was brilliant and it was so honestly delivered in the birch character which we know has been so reluctant to connect emotionally with fitz and maybe that has to do with his reluctancy to connect through the wit you know like who knows and, and like that reluctancy mm-hmm. to have that emotional connection is but yet the love is still there and you know that as the reader like it goes a little bit unsaid but the a level of love that you know birch feels just to utter out that half completed sentence it, it is very powerful more powerful than anything you could explain outside of the interaction you know and that's again speaks to what mark lawrence is saying and she builds toward that so well by defining Birch's character to that point where you can actually see that moment and appreciate it for what it is if you've been paying close attention to mm. this character. And yeah, she's the subtlety is really impressive. And you mentioned we didn't we didn't talk mm. about Galen. I I'm okay with Galen not getting too much too much attention, but I do want to bring some attention to the mm. fool because the fool is a pretty huge character in this universe like there's a whole fits in the fool mm. trilogy uh where i assume <laughs> i've not read that either i assume the fool gets a larger presence <laughs> in that one um the fool uh, interesting when you think about like there's a i think the fool's actually a very influential character when you think about like let's say I'm um, going with this <laughs> there's like a, the king's wit yep, in the, the storm archives, archives yep. right which is like i was thinking the same yeah, thing and that yeah i was reading this and i was like how could sanderson not be like totally writing his own version oh 100 right now there's 100%. so many similarities and yeah so uh, and well, was he like, that's Fitz, how it Fitz works, right? We stand Fitz, on the shoulders of like, giants. But... And he's like, what? Yeah. He's like, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> Fitz, Fitz is Fitz. <laughs> I mean, whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. And... <laughs> it's like, that's something the no, wizard like said. something. It's like fat suffices. <laughs> There's something like, it's like fit. It's, it's something with fat suffices. But either way, the point is that you see a character like that and, and Hob basically created these like archetypes, maybe did create them. Like I'm sure they exist like the uh, preternatural fool archetype. I'm sure it's existed at some point before, but like you look at Sanderson's stormlight archive and wit and that it's like, it seems so inspired by the fool. And when you look at that and you say, okay, that seems to be, pretty similar and then you look at the Dana and quoth relationship in the king killer chronicle and you say wow that seems to be inspired by hobbs uh, treatment of molly and fitz and you know, all these other elements and just like this maybe is leading a little bit too much toward the oh let's think about the context and uh history and blah 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 that we're going to cover in more detail <laughs> in a future episode but it's it's hard not to <laughs> cook a little bit that cook it in this episode a little spice it's it's really important to yeah <laughs> was it fits fix vice you, fits fat suffices fit? that's the quote <laughs> <laughs> fits fix vice fits fat suffices yeah, like good. it's a question mark at the end i love that he like repeats it you know it was like the yeah. of, uh, fits like what and he's like ah I just said it. <laughs> he says it again. And you're like, uh, it's, it's bizarre. No, you're right. I mean, there's no question that this work is influential for a lot of modern classics, too. And it, the beats that people have picked up from the story, I think, are very interesting. And even now, we get a lot of stories that end as like a sad drama. It's kind of like a pretty popular way to go. Um, I, I just... You know, it sits very early in time and it's kind of fascinating. And there's kind of like a gap in years between all the stuff it influenced, you know, is kind of interesting to see that. Like you can to see like with Wheel of Time, you can see how maybe some of that had an influence on, on George R. R. Martin. I think like the Perrin 
character in Wheel of Time to Jon Snow, like some of these early tropes, but there's some unique things here. She's kind of writing her own genre and fantasy, and it's, I don't know, it, it's hard not to mention. And the, and the Fool is a very interesting case of that. And definitely you could swap the Fool and the Wit, like their voice, and like the stuff they do, and... You could interchange him to me, and, and I would be kind of like, yeah, I believe it. Like, their, their voice is very similar, um, and their yeah. position in court is very similar. But who knows how much else is similar, you know? The, the, the uh, you know, who's to say? Mm. But it does, it is implied that there's a Fitz and the Fool, you know, whole adventure series. But who knows? It could mean anything. Uh, you, you can't take anything... It could mean anything. I'm just naming the title <laughs> the of a title series. Of a series. <laughs> so I'm sorry if the I'm sorry if it's a spoiler. But it's a series. I I don't know if it's a spoiler. I've been spoiled as well because there's a like I don't know. I've just seen books that are called the Fitz and the Fool right. trilogy. <laughs> well, I mean, well, we know Fitz doesn't die in these stories uh, based on the fact that he's telling the story yes. from the future. So at we, least know we know that, that there's something. <laughs> will yeah. his life go terribly? Yeah, exactly. Probably. Like, but it will will he end. Die? He'll come close to <laughs> before it. Before the end of this like, book. He did almost drown in this one. And he's like poisoned. And he's like, will my body ever be the same? And you're like, oh, that's kind of a heavy, heavy thing to leave us with in this story. Tough yeah, sitch. that's a tough sitch. You know, after being rescued by Nosy, um, uh, and was given to the Mountain Kingdom as a gift. And that was another very touching thing about Birch, that Birch wasn't even in the scene. And we're endeared towards him because we realize that he didn't just kill a sweet puppy. He gave it to someone else and it lived a full, happy life. You know, that like, oh, Birch does have like a heart in him after all. He, and then even Birch was like, you thought that I just straight up killed a puppy and you thought that? your whole life like why would i i love that i, I love that yeah. scene it's like why would i have done that he's like oh psycho? no wonder you, you hated me sometimes or you no i <laughs> gave him away it's like yeah that could have been it's played so comedic, but he's like yeah no wonder you harbor so much resentment against me and he's like and still you like tolerated me and this and that you know it was, it was funny it was i was kind of laughing i was like oh if only we could talk to each other you know that would clear a whole bunch of things up but we don't get that. What's also interesting is that re- we get that. Wait, yeah, no, we we Let's go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna transition it. there, like, but we get that here, Charles. You and me, uh, we get to talk and clear things. Oh, up you're gonna wrap it up. You sound oh. like you have more oh, to oh, say. Oh, oh, I was oh, gonna oh. like move toward no, because I want up, like where are you leaving Charles, the story and where it's no. going, right? Because we've got this whole thing of yeah, another interesting thing. Regal basically attempted to kill Verity and Verity and Shrewd know about it. And Verity yeah. and Shrewd are like, don't do anything to Regal. And you're like, what is this? Like society is just keeping Regal up and keeping him going. No matter how much failed, bra- overly brazen assassination attempts. It makes me think of like modern billionaires, you know, it's like, Oh no, 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 no. Don't, don't like sent, don't put him to justice because he's too famous and, like too important uh, it's part of the vi- like the family image we can't you know let's sweep it under the rug let's not talk about it you know and you're like why is it, why is this guy failing upwards like he he gets away with it and he wasn't even yeah. that clever about it he just straight up killed the guy when everyone was like well it would be stupid to kill him now and then he just kills him and you're like what <laughs> This is the guy that gets the pass you know and meanwhile Fitz is condemned to like just being totally screwed forever it's it's kind of an interesting place that we end up and now like all the cards on the table with regal right it's like okay as detestable as his character was he's like actively plotting to kill the rest of the family and like that's kind of a problem too so yeah it's a it's an interesting situation that we end in it is and it's uh, we'll have to see where Regal goes in the future. It's definitely uh, going to be a bit awkward, I think, between <laughs> be Verity and Regal. Awkward conversations at the dinner table, for sure. Brother yeah. tries to kill you. <laughs> it's going to be a little like, "Hey, man, like that was past the cool. salt, but try not to poison it first. That, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nice. Get that little jab in there. It's 
going to be strange. Faraday, he's, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. He's kind of in the, obviously he came before Ned Stark, but he's got the, he's got Ned Stark situation where he's, he's the second son, was trained to be a warrior and fighter, very straightforward, Mm -hmm. honest guy. And now he has to be in the position of like being the, the head yeah, honcho. And he's and, trying uh, to do right. And the family. He's locking himself in his tower and, using the skill yeah. to try and deflect the warships, which is this looming threat we never talked about. These warships that would come and forge people. And, you know, like it takes a, it's a pretty side plot to the story, but it, it's kind of interesting that these, these, this foreign entity is just wreaking havoc and not even with any kind of motivation for like political or financial gain just to literally tear down this this kingdom and it's even like hey you either pay the fine and we'll kill them or you don't pay the fine and we'll return them to you and it's like what kind of demented (laughs) villain is this like i it's like (laughs) so bizarre and then they will just pick on random villages and this and that and it's it's an interesting enemy that we know almost nothing about yeah, and in another story, this could be the most central conflict maybe. where there'd be All lots of White fighting Walkers, and maybe? <laughs> intense stuff. Yeah, it does have that kind Not of nearly as ominous feel and to it, as that. It's much more direct, it's, but um, it's that same kind of vibe yeah. where it's like, eh, this might be a problem for later. Yeah, so I think definitely laying some breadcrumbs, the foundations of something that could be explored in the future. I don't know how much we get into this in this trilogy or in future stuff in this world, uh, because there's uh, that, is, that fits in the fool mm. trilogy, Charles. Who says and it's the same fits and the, the same the fool, you limits, know. But if Fitz is just a surname. Could be any you know, fits, uh, any fool, but. Uh, Fool <laughs> it's is a just title a that's given to of a person. there's lots of fools sure there's no guarantee there's lots of fools ain't that the truth <laughs> speaking of lots <laughs> <Okay>. of fools <laughs> 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 maybe we should wrap this up before things yeah. get too off the rails but i am look i have already started the second book i'm just like i was enjoying this more than i expected and i'm and i'm really excited to read through the trilogy um, you know, we got a lot of other books to read on Friends Talking Fantasy, but it, it'll be nice to get the Don't full context ever. of the series in the FTF library. You know, I'm very excited to put the Farseer trilogy and its completion into the catalog for the show. And I, and I can't wait to talk about book two. Well said, Charles. I'm looking forward to starting book two and to discussing it with you. But for now, I think I think we've pretty much said it all. Besides, really getting into anything about Galen or the Galen's like, also Chip interesting because he was like technically but, like a bastard too, but he also got to like, yeah, yeah. That's why he hated. It's a it's a that's like a theme of Robin Hobbs. It's, like it's specifically so fits that we don't hate. like. <laughs> Well, no, well, yes, but also it's like characters, like I've been saying, they hate the what they see in themselves uh, in others. You know, they hate the part they don't like about themselves when it shows right. up in and other and people. And Fitz so seems to show a very uh, strong Galen, proclivity uh, to that note again. the skill. Yeah. Because um, there's those moments where Galen's like, who taught you? Like, I know you're borrowing skill from somebody. And then I love when Verity literally fucking freaking drains the strength out of Fitz. You know, it's just like, let me almost kill you by, yeah. let me take your essence basically and drain you to near death and then he does use that power to kill galen you know it's kind of a funny thing like here it is where like they're figuratively and literally draining this poor boy <laughs> like milking him for everything he's got every ounce of strength that he has like taking advantage of his blood and everything that comes with it to for their own gain and even from someone like verity who means the best you know he, he means well he's probably the most one of the most caring people in Fitz's life in this book, right? Like up there with Birch and Patience and at least Verity, maybe not as loving, but respectful and sees him as an equal in a lot of ways. Um, so interesting there. But before, let's just, let's just play the outro. What do you say? <laughs> 
<laughs> How's that for a segue? <laughs> sweet, sweet outro music. Let's get it pumping. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, one and all, for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. If you like what you heard today, if you have more to say about Verity or Galen or any of these other wonderful characters... Has to be all you Galen stands better rise up <laughs> over on up social media Galen. that's uh, at the FTF podcast <laughs> on Instagram and at the FTF podcast with a number one at the end on t- X Twitter um, uh, but Dylan if they like what they heard today and they want to support the show even more than following us on talking to us over on social media what can they do toss five stars to our podcast which you can do over on spotify it's just two clicks at the top of the friends talking fancy podcast feed and it helps us so much when you do that you can also rate and or review on apple podcasts you can write a review you can write all these nice things about us and anytime you do that it puts a smile on my face and presumably on charles's face as well but just listening is more than enough thank you so just much for listening as dylan said guys that's incredible thank you all so much for making it to the end thank you thank you thank you and as always go forth and conquer friends